everybody. Welcome to our event on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, I'm John Chorchari. I'm the co-director of the International Policy Center here at the Ford School. Uh, we're delighted you can come uh, to join us. Uh, first, I want to thank the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies here at the International Institute who helped support this event. I also want to thank our administrator, Thea Rowe, uh, for her work in, in organizing it. Uh, we're privileged to have two distinguished panelists who you see in front of you, uh, Dr. Shai Feldman and Dr. Khalil Shikaki. Uh, Dr. Feldman is the Judith and Sidney Swartz Director of the Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis University. Uh, he's also a senior fellow and a member of the board at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, he's a fifth generation Israeli, uh, and for some 28 years he was at Tel Aviv's Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies, first as a sen senior researcher and then as the center's director. Last but not least, uh, he was a, is a former student of our own Bob Axelrod, who supervised him at the master's level. Uh, so obviously very, very well trained. Uh, Dr. Shikaki is a professor of political science and, <laughs> and a director of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at the Crown Center at Brandeis, uh, and he is a recent visiting scholar here at the University of Michigan, where he spent some time last year. And some of you had the privilege of getting to meet and know him then. Both are internationally recognized experts on Israeli-Palestinian issues and on Middle Eastern politics more broadly. Uh, you can find more details on their impressive backgrounds in the advertisement for the session. And if you haven't grabbed one already on your way in, please get one on the way out, a recent policy brief that Dr. Feldman co-authored, uh, which is on the table just outside of those center doors. Um, our guests will start with some brief remarks uh, on Current developments and future prospects for uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will then move to a conversation and a question and answer session. Uh, Bilal Baidun, who's uh, an MPP candidate here at the Ford School, is going to help me field your questions on cards and then to ask a representative sample. Thea will walk around uh, the audience and collect your questions on note cards. She'll also have some cards to pass out in pencils if you didn't grab one on your way in. And so without further ado, let's please welcome Dr. Feldman and Dr. Shikaki back to Michigan. Thank you, John. Great to be back here. Uh, great to see Bob. <laughs> um, so what I thought I would do is, uh, is the following. Um, for the past 11 years, this is uh, the 11th uh, fall, that um, Khalil and I, together uh, with an Egyptian colleague, Abdul Munim Saeed, uh, have been teaching a class uh, at Brandeis on the Arab-Israeli conflict, team teaching a class on the Arab-Israeli conflict. So the students, uh, for an entire semester, uh, learn about the conflict from a team which comprises an Israeli, a Palestinian, uh, and an Egyptian. Um, and to, uh, got, I think almost exactly two years ago, uh, an effort that lasted about seven summers uh, culminated in the translation of the, our experience teaching this, co-teaching, team teaching this class, uh, to the publication of uh, a textbook, the first textbook on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict that is co-authored by a Palestinian, an Egyptian, and an Israeli scholar. It's called Arab, Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East. If any of you want to have a little more information about it. There are some handouts here. But the reason uh, I mention this is because uh, the analytical section, so uh, this is a textbook that's written for an American university, which is to say for an American semester, for a 13 week semester. We have the book comprises of 13 chapters and all the chapters have the same structure, which is the first third of every chapter it's called Main Developments. It basically provides the reader with uh, the uncontested dimensions of the history of the conflict. And it is quite surprising that the uncontested dimensions of the Arab-Israeli conflict can fill actually an entire third of a chapter in, for each of, the sec each of the periods of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uncontested means means uh, that Arabs and Israelis don't contest what happened during this period. And 
How do we know that uh, a certain development wasn't contested? Uh, if the three of us agreed uh, that it happened, then it's, it happened. Uh, the, second, the, second third, the second third of every uh, chapter uh, is about everything that is contested. Uh, and the nice uh, part of that is that for the second third of every chapter, you can read side by side for everything that is contested in the history of the conflict, what was the Palestinian narrative uh, about what happened? What was the Israeli narrative about what happened? And what were broader Arab narratives about what happened? And finally, the final third of every chapter provides is the analytical part. It's called analysis. And, um, and essentially, it, the aim is to provide a toolbox uh, for students to, uh, to analyze uh, the most important turning points in the history uh, of the conflict. So the idea is to provide students the kind of toolbox that they can use a year later, three years later, and so on and so forth. So we analyze the past, but the idea is to provide a toolbox that allows students to, to try to understand uh, the, the present and the future. The toolbox is very simple. It basically says you want to understand everything, anything important that happened in the history of the conflict, you have to answer for yourselves essentially four questions. One, what happened in the international arena that can explain what happened in the conflict? Second, what happened in the regional context, in the regional arena, in the Middle East at large that can explain what happened between Israelis and Palestinians uh, and Arabs during this period? Third, um, what, ha what happened in the domestic politics? in the domestic politics of the main protagonists that could have been a driver uh, for these turning points. Uh, and finally, what was the role of individual leaders uh, in affecting uh, these uh, turning points? So what I thought I would do in uh, the remaining of my opening remarks is to try to apply in very broad terms this analytical framework to, to get you a sense of uh, why uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict today, is in such deep uh, trouble. And I think the best way to understand this is to compare where we are today to a period that um, I would consider uh, the golden era of Palestinian-Israeli peace efforts. And the golden era was 1991 to 1995. It's a golden era more broadly in Arab-Israeli uh, peace efforts. And it was only a few days ago that Israel uh, commemorated, no noted uh, 20 years uh, to the assassination of uh, the then Israeli Prime Minister uh, Rabin. And that assassination 20 years ago ended, in a way, that golden era that began uh, in 1991. During this, during this period of 1991 to 1995, there were a, a, not one, but a, a quite a few dramatic uh, positive developments in Arab-Israeli relations, Palestinian-Israeli relations. Uh, there was the 1991 Madrid conference, the first time that Arab states convened with Israel for the purpose of making peace uh, in the Middle East. That launched a whole set of bilateral uh, negotiations, uh, including Israeli-Syrian negotiations, and something that everybody already forgot ever existed, a, a very a broad, deep, uh, multilateral set of, of negotiations uh, between Israel, 13 Arab countries, and the Palestinians dealing with a whole set of issues involving uh, economic development, refugees, uh, regional security and arms control, uh, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, you had the Oslo breakthrough uh, in uh, September two, uh, 1993. And finally, uh, the, uh, the, the last dramatic positive uh, in November 1994, uh, the Israeli-Jordanian uh, peace treaty. So what allowed uh, the, this golden era to take place? First of all, so now I'll try to answer for myself, help, help you. Um, 
What happened at the global, regional, domestic politics and individual leaders that explain uh, this, uh, th these positive breakthroughs? Uh, essentially, this is a period that followed right after the end of the Cold War, um, the, war the Cold War ending with an, an American victory. Uh, the U.S. was able to talk about a new world order that the U.S. Uh, would, would lead and a new regional order that the U.S. Uh, would lead. At the regional level, you had just uh, been through the Gulf War, in which the U.S. led a, successfully a very broad coalition of Arab countries that included Egypt and Syria in a war to dislodge uh, Iraq from the conquest uh, uh, of Iran, led by a president, uh, Bush 41, who knew not only how to wage war, but also where, when to stop a war. Um, and again, with an ambition to, 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 create, a new, uh, to new, uh, create a new regional order. And this, as I said, was a coalition that included Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, even Syria. Um, and that, coalition, that victory actually also tilted the balance within the region between, say, the more moderate, the more pro-Western countries uh, and, and, the, and the more militant extremist uh, elements in, in the region. Uh, at the domestic level, uh, the, driver, the domestic drivers were uh, a PLO, uh, weakened by the Gulf War, weakened by the perception uh, that Arafat sided with Saddam Hussein. He managed to get, to, to get the financial backers of the PLO uh, angry uh, at, at the PLO for, for seeming to be, have sided with Saddam Hussein. Um, and uh, essentially, the PLO, because of that, was driven to a whole set of, uh, of compromises and concessions, beginning with their agreement to go to Madrid in the framework of a joint Jordanian-Palestinian uh, delegations, and finally to accept major uh, concessions uh, at Oslo. Israel um, had to absorb a million refugees, a million immigrants from the former Soviet Union, uh, which gave the United States huge leverage over, U over Israeli policy because Israel was dependent on getting $10 billion of US uh, government loan guarantees to be able to absorb uh, those million uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, you had the effects of the first Palestinian Intifada that persuaded Israelis that at the time that the occupation was not uh, a feasible indefinite proposition. All of this led to a change in governments in Israel from Likud uh, uh, to labor, uh, with labor winning the 1992 uh, election. So the Israeli domestic scene also changed as a result of these, uh, of these various uh, changes. At the individual level, you had an architect. Uh, at the very least, uh, to some extent, it was uh, Bush uh, 41, but more um, in a real practical manner, it was Jim Baker, who was the architect of this effort to create a new uh, world order and a new regional order. And he was the one who got he used the leverage that, uh, that the U.S. acquired. He used the leverage vis-a-vis -vis the Arab parties like Syria uh, and the PLO and, and the U.S. leverage on Israel to get everybody um, to Madrid. You had leaders on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side who had legitimacy and who could deliver. Arafat on the Palestinian side and Rabin uh, on the Israeli side. So. All the, all the stars were aligned in the right direction. The stars on the, on the global level, on the regional level, on the domestic politics level, and on the leadership level. None of this, none of these exist today. None of these exist today. Okay. The US, following um, two wars in the Middle East, $2 trillion, doesn't have the ambition uh, to, uh, to build a new regional order. Uh, President Obama tried twice in 2009 and 2011, uh, 12, uh, 13, uh, to uh, negotiate some deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, and failed. It is extremely unlikely that Obama is going to try uh, a third time. The region is in total disarray. Um, Countries that uh, when we grew up for the first uh, 40 years of our lives or 50 years of our lives, or actually 60 years of at least my life up until five years ago, 
who were central pillars of the region, no longer exist. Uh, Syria no longer exists as we know it, as we knew it. Iraq no longer exists as we knew it. Libya, not exactly a pillar, no longer exists as we knew it. Yemen no longer exists uh, as we knew it. And all the Arab countries are, without exception, consumed by the various ripple effects of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, and so their attention uh, is, is all directed internally. And the likelihood right now that they're going to roll up their sleeves in the immediate uh, future uh, and try to play a positive role uh, is very, very, uh, is very unlikely. Uh, the domestic politics, uh, on, I'll say on the Israeli side, Khalil will say more on the Palestinian side. The, the Israeli, essentially, the, on the Israeli side, the right wing controls the agenda or determines the agenda right now. The, Israeli right wing determines the agenda, in my view, not because it comprises a majority. It is able to control the agenda in Israel's case because the center and the center left of the map is paralyzed. It's at home. It's not active. It didn't change its views. It continues to support the two-state solution. But first of all, it's, high, it's very, very pessimistic about the ability to implement uh, to achieve a two-state solution. So even though that's still the preference, uh, it, it, after Rabin's assassination, and Rabin's assassination was a turning point, it was the first turning point. The second intifada was the second turning point. So Israelis, um, basically, uh, it, m those people that still believe that the two-state solution is the only solution uh, are not active, mobilized, committed uh, in the way that the, that the uh, large minority uh, of those on the right wing that are opposed to a two-state solution uh, are. They are also paralyzed by fear. Uh, fear that um, which is based on a very simple analysis that said Israel withdrew from Lebanon in 2005 and the result uh, was Katyusha rockets. And two, in 2000, and the result was Katyusha rockets from from Lebanon that paralyzed the Israeli north uh, on more than one occasion. Israel withdrew from Gaza in summer of 2005, and the result was all kinds of rockets coming from Gaza that paralyzed the Israeli south. And so the simple Israeli says, um, if we withdraw from the West Bank to allow a Palestinian state, who guarantees that this reality is not going to uh, to replicate itself, where the center core of the country is, where the large population centers are, where 80% of Israel's GDP uh, is, is produced. And finally, there is all this fear that results now in the last three or four years from, the from everything going on around Israel. And when there is such turbulence, such chaos in, in, in a place as proximate as, as Syria, and when you're in Israel, it's a very different uh, reality than here because uh, everybody in Syria has cell phones and everybody in Syria documents, makes these little tiny videos and it's on YouTube and it's bro broadcast and rebroadcast and rebroadcast in Israel. And so you're very, very, very close to the slaughter uh, that has already taken the lives of, of uh, uh, I don't know what the number is now, some people speculate as, as high as 300,000. Uh, in the Syrian sphere. And finally, at the individual level, there's no Rabin and there's no Arafat. Uh, there is a, uh, I would say, a um, lack of courage, lack of real leadership. Um, and uh, uh, again, Khalil will uh, maybe disagree with me, but, uh, but I, I think he, he won't, that uh, Abbas is not Arafat and <laughs> Netanyahu is not Rabin. Uh, and, and so basically, if you look at all the four levels, uh, the situation, and you contrast them to the golden era of the peace process, 91-95, uh, um, you know, other, other than sending you to the nearest pharmacy to get a bottle of Prozac, uh, I, I don't uh, have at least uh, in these in this opening remarks a, 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 a way of uplifting uh, your hopes because uh, the situation right now is a, probably a really, really, really one of the, one of the most uh, depressing downsides uh, uh, in, 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 in this history of trying to resolve 
the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and so I'll stop here before it gets worse. <laughs> I'm also very happy to be back. Thank you, John, for inviting us to be back here. Um, I thought I would say something optimistic and I would have something to disagree with, and, but then he ends with a highly pessimistic note. So we will be competing in who is more pessimistic. <laughs> Um, Shai focused on what he called the golden era of the peace process um, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, <clears throat> and compared it with the current situation. I'll be doing something similar, um, looking at not 20 years back, but 10 years back. Basically, the way I'm, I'm going to define the, the current predicament that Palestinians and Israelis find themselves in is that the, the past 10 years, a certain status quo has emerged in Israeli-Palestinian relations. This status quo is currently being challenged. It is being challenged by the establishment itself that created that status quo. Um, this is, however, is going to be a political confrontation. It is about to start. It is a little bit of that is starting, but my expectation is that we will witness in, in 2016 um, significant uh, political confrontations between the establishment in the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. And the second uh, dimension of this challenge is the popular challenge. Uh, the, the, the confrontations in the streets, the stabbing and the, and the response by the Israeli army and the Israeli police and so on. The violence, in other words. And, and this violence uh, at this moment, it's, it's not a major explosion of violence, but my expectation is that it will become gradually a more, uh, um, more serious uh, explosion in 2016. So wh wh what, is hap what had happened? Why are we today, therefore, moving in this trajectory that uh, we are more likely to find ourselves in, in a major Israeli-Palestinian confrontation, both political, diplomatic, and, and violent. And to understand <clears throat> why this is happening, I, I will take you a little bit uh, uh, 10 years back. 10 years ago or so, um, we have seen the beginnings of what became the status quo. Um, this status quo, um, was based on the assumption that it is in the interest of the Palestinians and the Israelis to have peace and quiet. So 10 years ago, this is the end of the second intifada, 2005, both the Palestinian establishment, unlike the previous establishment in the Palestinian Authority under Arafat, at the new establishment defined the Palestinian national interest in peace and quiet terms and this is, of course, was also the definition that the Israelis uh, very much adopted. So this element of the status quo was based, of course, on rebuilding the Palestinian security services. Um, but it was also, and of course, allowing the Palestinian economy to prosper and, so, and the Palestinian Authority to build institutions uh, and so on and so forth. But it was also based on two additional pillars. One is, Israel is not required to abandon any of the gains it made during the Second Intifada. Palestinians made some gains during the Second Intifada, most importantly in Gaza, but not much in the West Bank. In fact, in the West Bank, things became much worse for the Palestinians because the Israeli army reoccupied the West Bank. The new status quo was uh, sort of a unwritten de facto kind of status quo. The Palestinians did not explicitly agree to it, but on de facto basis, they did. The, this new arrangement did not require the Israeli army to undo the changes it made during the uh, years of the Second Intifada. Um, thirdly, 
the new status quo, that the post-Intifada status quo, did not require the Israelis to implement any of their commitments under Oslo, commitments that were not implemented before the eruption of the Second Intifada. There are major elements in Oslo, most importantly related to Israeli withdrawals from the West Bank and the transfer of jurisdiction from the Israeli army to the Palestinian Authority that did not take place before the eruption of the Second Intifada. These elements in Oslo were now suspended. In fact, it is even worse. Oslo began, and the terms of Oslo, which were supposed to be temporary and interim in nature, now looked more like a semi-permanent deal. So this, again, these are not things that the Palestinians explicitly endorsed or negotiated with the Israelis, but these are terms that the new status quo entailed with Palestinian, if, if not endorsement, and in this case, I am referring to the establishment, that is the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, more or less not challenging. Okay, so what, what made that possible helps us understand why it is no longer possible for this status quo to continue. What made that possible? Well, most importantly, Abbas, the Palestinian president, Abbas's own mindset has been a very critical element in all of this. He is a person who actually believed that violence, Palestinian violence, was very destructive to Palestinian national interests. He believed wholeheartedly that it is in the national interest of the Palestinians uh, not only to stop the violence, but also to fight against violence along with the Israeli side. Abbas also believed that institution building for the Palestinians, most importantly, creating a strong, effective police force that would have monopoly over force, armed uh, arms, in, in, meant that there would be no arms in the Palestinian Authority under his control, other than that of the police, which meant essentially dismantling, or at least disarming, all the militias all the armed groups that prevailed in the West Bank. Abbas's goal, therefore, was to rebuild the Palestinian Authority. And, in, and to be able to achieve all of that, he was willing to engage or to resume Israeli-Palestinian security coordination. That security coordination, by the way, is, that, is the kind of evidence that the Israelis read to mean that the Palestinians are fine with the status quo, fine with the elements of the status quo that I uh, indicated earlier. Obviously, with, with the Palestinians seeing it in their best interest to ensure peace and quiet, the Israelis perhaps felt that things are really pretty good. The status quo is pretty good. Why change it? And that, of course, then leads to this prevailing attitude that Oslo maybe is not a bad thing if it is a permanent or, or more permanent thing. The second most important pillar that made it possible for this status quo to prevail was, of course, the emergence of Hamas, not, not only as a threat to the Israelis, but in this case, of course, most importantly, a threat to the Palestinian establishment, a threat to the Palestinian Authority itself. The, the threat is not just the outcome of the elections when Hamas won in 2006, although that is part of it. The more important threat is the Hamas violent takeover of the Gaza Strip. Violently, Hamas took over Gaza from the Palestinian Authority, from President Abbas, and assumed control, unilateral control over Gaza, Abbas and Farah and the PA establishment as a whole feared that Hamas will do in the West Bank what it did in Gaza. Ah, so now, security coordination with the Israelis would even have an added value. It becomes a way of self-defense against an internal enemy. That was certainly a second 
a very important uh, reason why the, this status quo has prevailed at that time. There was also, of course, other things, uh, very important things, including some of the things that Chai mentioned. The U.S. stepped in. Starting in 2006, we had a major U.S. push under the Bush administration. Uh, the, the, the Annapolis process started around the end of that year, so there was a revival of the peace process. Serious negotiations took place in 2008. So, and, and the international community stepped in. in. In one year, the international community pledged to give the Palestinian Authority $5 billion in the next three years or so. You can see the extent to which both the U.S., which up until then really has not put a lot of effort, I'm talking about the Bush administration, in investing in the Israeli-Palestinian peace efforts. All of a sudden, it's putting considerable amount of effort. And the international community, the donor community, putting a lot of money in the Palestinian Authority. There is no doubt that there was also a significant element of public endorsement, Palestinian public endorsement. You have to understand that when Arafat died in 2004 and Abbas was elected, the public perception among the Palestinians, I'm not talking about the Israelis, although we also found similar trends among the Israelis back then. This is end of 2004, early 2005. 2005 is when this status quo essentially was, was put in place. What, what was, what was the, the, the impression of the public at, at that time is, is very, very important, particularly when we compare it to where we're today. Back then, the level of optimism about the peace process went sky high. The death of Arafat was, and the election of Abbas was seen the public, by the public as an indication that peace is just a short distance away. That if Abbas can't make peace, the father of Oslo, the most moderate, the most peaceful Palestinian leader, if he can't make peace, well, peace is simply impossible with Israel. The expectation, however, was Abbas will do it. And the level of optimism that we found in, in 2005 was simply unprecedented in, in, in those terms. But there was obviously other things that facilitated Abbas's, uh, Abbas going in this direction. Most importantly, the fact that he was elected in 2005. He was elected by 63% of the popular vote. So he had tremendous legitimacy. He could do whatever he wanted to do. The public voted for him. His, his, his election campaign was based on the elements I've just described in, in his own mindset. So he considered the vote that he received as an endorsement of his own platform in terms of organizing relations with the state of Israel. So what happened to all of these things? Well, to begin with, of course, let me agree with Shai on what he said about where the Americans uh, are today. After the efforts uh, at Annapolis failed, we had a new administration, and the president again attempted to get the Israelis to freeze settlements and get Palestinians to go back to the negotiations, and that effort failed. And then we have the, in the second term, we had the Kerry mission, and that too has failed. And the reaction of the administration after the failure of, of the Kerry mission was, well, we tried at least, uh, but I think the, Shai and I were in Washington uh, a few days ago talking to people in the administration. Um, uh, my impression from these talks, Shai may disagree with me, uh, but my impression is the administration has absolutely, definitely no interest whatsoever in putting its hand back into this thing called Palestinian-Israeli relations. They have absolutely no interest in that. And, and they think there is absolutely nothing there that they can do, that even if they try, they will fail. And so they, they do not want to try. And of course, if you look at the region, uh, the region is really preoccupied with everything you can think of, in, from ISIS to their own domestic affairs. Um, so you cannot really rely on the region 
to come forward and, and assess, assist the Palestinians. There are a lot of people who talk about the Arab Peace Initiative and putting it together. But the Arab world, in theory, this sounds really nice, but the Arab world isn't there really to get together uh, and, and try to provide um, a safe haven for Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiations. But it's not just about the region. In fact, I think it is more so the domestic environment. The domestic environment both in Israel and among the Palestinians. Uh, the Israelis are still under the influence of the last decade of status quo, what I described as the status quo, and their impression about it is it's really good, we had peace and quiet. Of course, they are now very worried about what's happening, um, and, and it, this, this could certainly generate change. We don't know when. It is not likely to be soon, and we don't know in what direction. In the past, we saw that uh, when the threat perception is high, both Palestinians and Israelis become very, very aggressive against each other and demand revenge and violence against each other. So uh, if the same thing is to happen here again, and if I am right and next year is going to be hell for both Israelis and Palestinians, then it's likely that this will actually lead to greater, uh, a more hellish kind of environment. Palestinians have a problem with the man and the establishment that has created that status quo. Finally, the Palestinian public is awakened, so to speak, and basically said, who the hell put this status quo in place? Why did we accept to do this for the last 10 years? As I said, the public has something to do with that, but the public, of course, is in denial at this point. The public believes today that the leader who put this in place has no legitimacy anymore. Two-thirds, in our, two months ago, in our most recent survey, said <clears throat> Abbas must resign. 53% of the Palestinians said this Palestinian authority and its establishment is becoming a burden on the Palestinian people. For the first time ever since the creation of the Palestinian Authority, we have a majority that defines the Palestinian Authority as a burden on the Palestinians. For the first time, we also have a majority that says the Palestinian Authority must be dismantled. The question of the PA legitimacy, therefore, is no longer a question. The Palestinian public, which fully endorsed early on in the, this last decade, the status quo I described, today is revolting against it and consider, is this considering the establishment that put it in place as illegitimate. But the public is even angrier with the Israelis, of course. Um, the, the, the public believes the two-state solution is no longer practical. Two-thirds of the Palestinian public believe the two-state solution is no longer practical. We have much greater support today for a one-state solution. There is even more. In, in that respect than this. We have what you might call the Oslo generation. This is a socio-political development that has been taking place with us not fully really focused on it, but it is becoming very clear with the young, young people in the streets, uh, university students who are confronting Israeli soldiers every day and dying every day. Last month in October, 73 Palestinians died. Uh, many of them in confrontations like these, but of course others died while attempting to stab soldiers or, or Israeli civilians inside Israel. 12 Israelis have died during those confrontations. This Oslo generation is essentially people, the age of, of many of the students here, 18 to 22 is the age of this particular group. The higher, you, the, the older the, you are, the more likely that whatever I am about to say will not apply to you. But if you are 18 to 22, living in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, then you fit the description. You are totally alienated from the political process. You consider the Palestinian Authority as illegitimate. You consider the two-state solution to be unacceptable you're more likely, in insignificant percentages, you're more likely to believe that a one-state solution is the way to move forward. They are not driven by religion. They are not driven by support for Hamas. These are 
This age group is the most secular in Palestinian society. They are the least religious in Palestinian society. They believe in violence. We had, during this last decade, for the most part, with the exception of the period in which Gaza was at war with Israel, uh, Hamas was at war with Israel during the Gaza war, with that exception, with that exception, during the last 10 years, up until two months ago, we did not have a majority of Palestinians in favor of violence. We had a majority, a strong majority, against violence among all Palestinians, including among this age group of what I described as Oslo generation. Today, males in this Oslo generation support violence by 72%. This is unprecedented with the exception of very exceptional periods during the Second Intifada. We never had such radicalization among Palestinian youth. Where is this radicalization coming from? Well, coming from everything I've just described, of course, the lack of progress and the perception that the PA is illegitimate, but there is an additional component that makes the young, this youth group, to be more likely to be influenced by radical uh, views, and that is their reliance on social media. For this age group, 85% of them rely, 85% rely on social media for news on a daily basis. Now compare this to those who are 50 and above. 50 and above rely on social media for news by 4%. So only 4% of 50 and above look for news in the social media, while 85% of this Oslo generation looks for, media in the social, uh, looks, uh, uh, for news in the social media. The social media is very, very vicious, very, very poisonous, exaggerates everything. It is uh, no doubt that this is something that will continue. Um, people see videos of, of things happening uh, almost live, and it is generating a great deal of anger, frustration, and it is driving people, and particularly the, the students, uh, to, to come out and demonstrate. I did not anticipate that this will become a third intifada, at least not anytime soon. I, I think the escalation, what I described uh, as an escalation, these emerging confrontations are likely to continue to escalate, but it will be gradual. It will be gradual. I know my time is probably up, have been for a while, <laughs> um, is because on the one hand, as, as long as Abbas remains in charge, he will continue to oppose outright violence. Um, there is also that threat from Hamas. It has not disappeared. So the PA, the Palestinian Authority establishment in the West Bank, still has to worry about its back and worry about Hamas. So it isn't going to be willing to completely disengage from security coordination with the Israelis, at least not soon. There's also public distrust in, in both the, main, the two major political forces, Fareh and Hamas, which means that they're really not likely to be willing to engage directly, uh, take orders from e either side, which will mean that popular participation in all of this will not be very high. The Palestinian police force, the last 10 years, had in fact succeeded um, significantly, have succeeded significantly in creating a very professional Palestinian security force. This security force is not going to, uh, to crumble under pressure. It is still very, very effective, and it has the capacity to prevent violence in the short term. Finally, the Israeli army, unlike its behavior in the Second Intifada, immediately after the eruption of the Second Intifada, the Israeli army made all the mistakes you can think of. The Israeli army is doing very few mistakes this time around. The Israeli army is much smarter in dealing with the current confrontations than it has ever been in the West Bank.
For these reasons, I think the escalation is likely to be gradual, and we are not likely to see a third intifada in, in erupting immediately. But this, of course, doesn't mean it won't at one point down the road. Abbas will probably become much, much weaker. The security services will be demoralized the first time there is a major violent incident in which too many Palestinians are killed. Um, th there is no doubt that the public at this point is not being driven by major triggers, like what happened in the second intifada with the Sharon uh, uh, visit to uh, Al Haram Sharif, uh, the, 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 the Temple Mount back in 2000. And, but uh, something like this happening in the next few months could very well uh, bring much larger popular participation. So, with this note, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say, uh, let's try to do something about this situation and, and prevent it. Um, and I can give you some ideas about how to do that. I'm not going to do that, although, uh, unless you ask about it. But, um, and, and the reason that I want is because I, I doubt very much that we will succeed. I doubt very much that there is anything that can be done um, given the constraints, both in Israel and, uh, and uh, on the Palestinian side, and, and given the fact that the Americans are absent, the Arabs are absent, the Europeans are absent, um, given all of this, it's highly unlikely that anything can be done to prevent this escalation from continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both uh, very much. Uh, you've laid out a compelling set of arguments about how at various levels the conditions are not at all auspicious for positive progress in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and, and indeed the, the status quo may be under grave threat for something worse. But I do want to pick up on, on what uh, Khalil ended uh, by saying and, and ask you a little bit about, about positive potentialities, however unlikely they, those may be. Um, Shai, in a conversation earlier, you described to me the idea of being a policymaker interested in making progress uh, in this conflict as being like an, an entrepreneur in a bad economy. And, and yet, you know, in your paper, uh, which is outside for folks on saving the Middle East, you do prefer a few ideas on ways that this entrepreneur, a set of entrepreneurs, could try to uh, turn around what is, what is undisputably a tough situation. Uh, I wonder if you could share a few of those, and then I'd love also to hear Khalil's responses to some of the ideas that you would suggest. So, let me just uh, sorry, see everybody. Um, there is one, uh, I think there is one uh, potential um, source of, uh, of, of, uh, of a positive uh, change. I'll also share with you where the limitations are. Uh, but side, uh, alongside uh, all the negatives uh, that we described, there is, uh, there is one thing that's, that is quite interesting uh, on the horizon. And what's interesting on the horizon is that compared to uh, um, previous periods, uh, side by side with the fact that, um, uh, as I said on many levels, when you compare the situation now to what, hap what was during the golden period of the Arab-Israeli peace process, uh, all the dimensions, all the trajectories seem to be negative. It's not quite uh, the picture because, uh, at least uh, in one respect, uh, we are in a positive, uh, to some res in some respects, a positive uh, new era. And the positive new era is that for the first time in the history of Arab-Israeli relations, uh, I wouldn't say the first time, but the degree of convergence between the interests of a number of Arab countries in the piece uh, that's outside, we call uh, these Arab countries uh, the Concert of Arabia. The Concert of Arabia is essentially consists of the monarchies. <clears throat> the monarchies have done, uh, by, by comparison, 
They have weathered the storms of the Arab, uh, the so-called Arab Spring, much better than the non-monarchies. Uh, so that includes Saudi Arabia, uh, the smaller uh, members of the GCC, uh, the North, Morocco, and so on, and Egypt, uh, the Republic member of the Concert of Arabia, uh, and Israel, uh, and. Uh, and, and, and the convergence of interests is that uh, all the members of this so-called Con Concert of Arabia, they, they just don't know yet that they are members of something called the Concert of Arabia. We invented it. Um, and Israel have two sets of um, common challenges, if not threats. One, all these countries are Sunni Arab countries. And uh, all of them regard the rising power of Iran and its, con and its increased involvement in various parts of the region, whether it's Syria, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's Yemen, as a threat. And the second thing is that they're all threatened by the rise of terrorism. Terrorism everywhere. And terrorism is everywhere in the region today. It's in Iraq. It's in Syria, it's in Lebanon, it's in Yemen, it's everywhere. And so the question is uh, uh, whether uh, you could see uh, some, and, and, and this uh, confluence or convergence of interests has already led to unprecedented levels of cooperation between Israel and a number of Arab countries. Uh, unprecedented level of cooperation between Israel and Jordan uh, <clears throat> because there is a common threat both from ISIS and from uh, all the threats revolving in southern Syria. Uh, there is unprecedented cooperation with Egypt uh, over the chaos uh, in the Sinai and everybody uh, involved in the Sinai and even the level of sharing intelligence uh, with other countries in the GCC including Saudi Arabia uh, is unprecedented. This is not an alliance, and it can become an alliance, but to become an alliance, uh, there is, an, as far as Israel is concerned, or even to become something less than an alliance, but an affiliate of the Concert of Arabia, <clears throat> there is an entry fee. And the entry fee is that Israel accept the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, which the Saudis regard as a Saudi peace initiative, um, at least as the basis for uh, further uh, negotiations on resolving uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, Arab conflict. The point, why this is, why this is um, an interesting turning point is because potentially it actually provides the members of the Concert of Arabia who are interested for their own reasons, in, in even greater cooperation with Israel, and who are interested in therefore Israel becoming an affiliate of this so-called Concert of Arabia, it gives also them a leverage over Israel. Because, of the, because the reality is that these threats, these challenges are uh, uh, common to Israel and, uh, and these countries. Um, so the question then is, number one, you know, would, so the, con the, the greater convergence of interest is already there. The trajectories are already there. The, there are two big questions here. Number one is, would uh, all the domestic Israeli constraints that I mentioned, that Khalil mentioned, allow Israel or the present Israeli government, will create a situation in which the present Israeli government will respond and and, and, and move in the direction of accepting uh, the entry, the, what I call the entry fee. There was already a slight, a slight change in the last few months when it, even Netanyahu said for the first time that there are quote unquote positive elements in the Arab Peace Initiative. That's very, very far from what's necessary to, uh, to, to, to con and the thing is, and the, and the other thing that's lacking right now is, and that goes back to my opening remarks, there is no architect. There is no Jim Baker, and there is no architect in the region. There is no Sadat, there is no, there is no, there's, there isn't anybody right now that can put the deal together. The Saudis are still sending the same signals, but the Saudis have never been um, 
architects in, in, in the region. Uh, so uh, what I would say is that there are certain build that aside from the bleak picture that both Khalil and I painted, there are some building blocks that provide some potential, uh, but there are big, big, big bots here which involve the, the two sides domestic scenes. Uh, in this case, uh, the Israeli domestic scene is a big problem and the fact that there is no Jim Baker. Uh, it's, by, by the way, one, one, one thing that uh, is not entirely accurate in what Khalil said about the U.S. government, there is still one person in the, US, in the U.S. government that would like to see a third try, and that's the Secretary of State, who seems to uh, have endless energies and endless optimism. Uh, uh, but the problem is that even that Secretary of State knows that he can't do that without the support of the President, without the support of the White House. And I think that Khalil's uh, description of uh, the skepticism. And so the result is that, uh, and, 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 and Kerry, with all of his success in negotiating a deal with Iran, still is not the kind of architect that we saw uh, Jim Baker operating at the global and regional level in the way that it has. So yes, I think that, uh, and, and, and again, uh, the other role that we have that I see us having, aside from uh, analysis, analyzing the situation, and my opening remarks gave you an analysis of, uh, of, of how I see the situation. Uh, but I see our uh, responsibilities of, as scholars to also think of ourselves as entrepreneurs, in this case, entrepreneurs in a very, very, very bad economy. Okay? But the thing about entrepreneurs uh, is that they don't have a luxury, even a very, in a very, very, very bad economy, to say, okay, you know, I'm going home, I'll come back in 10 years. Right? Entrepreneurs look for little tiny cracks wherever they exist, and I see a crack. The problem is I still don't see the architect that will exploit the crack. Uh, but I think Khalil disagrees with me even that there is a crack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll talk from you. The reason I don't think there is a crack is because I think Netanyahu thinks the Arabs need him more than he needs them, and they have to come to him um, and unconditionally. So I, I, I don't think Netanyahu feels he needs to give the Arabs anything for them to invite him to be part of this concert that Chai has spoken about. But more seriously, he, he doesn't feel that there is any pressure from within, inside Israel. Uh, for him to make that kind of move. To the contrary, as Shai said, the Israelis do not trust the Palestinians. They don't believe there is a Palestinian partner. So they don't think their prime minister is, is failing to pursue uh, peace with the Palestinians. Uh, the, they don't think the problem is on the Israeli side. They think the problem is on the Palestinian side. And because of that, Netanyahu's future is assured as the next prime minister. He wants to be the next prime minister. Um, and as long as he doesn't make mistakes, and he can begin to make mistakes, the minute he decides to pay a price for entering this concert, because he then immediately loses the right, which means he will have a completely different government. And, and then that also raises questions about him being prime minister the next time around when there is elections the next time around. And, and, the, and the right might not trust him to lead them the next time. And of course the left is not going to trust him to lead, to lead them or the center. And so it is safer. If you are not in the hour, it is safer for you to do nothing. Uh, if the Arabs need you, fine, the, you will work with them, but, but without having to pay a price on the Palestinian file where his constituency would punish him severely if he is to try to do anything there. So, however, one can, if you are able to change Netanyahu's calculus, if you are to actually convince him that his future as prime minister is threatened, he might change his mind. He is a pragmatist after all. He is a partly ideologue, but I think pragmatism would most likely prevail if he feels that there is pressure. Where would that pressure come from? Not domestically. It's not going to come from the Israeli public, as I said. Is the U.S. administration, for example, a good place to look for pressure after the Iran deal? The U.S. putting further pressure on Netanyahu? Are you kidding? It's not going to happen. 
Um, so I, I don't see Netanyahu uh, being convinced that he needs to move on the Palestinian file. And I think he also probably believe, and I think Shai uh, indicated that, that given all the turmoil in the region, it is time for Israel not to take risks, to stay put, do nothing, to keep control over the land and maintain the status quo as much as possible until things clarify, which could take 5, 10, 20 years. Um, but but in the, during that time, Israel should not take any risks. So I do not see change coming from that direction. I can see things changing on the Palestinian side if there is a potential for change. Assuming that what I just said about Netanyahu is inaccurate, assuming I am absolutely wrong that Netanyahu the, about Netanyahu and the U.S. administration and about Netanyahu's be, Netanyahu being willing to make a deal with the Arabs and actually make concessions on the Palestinian question. Uh, there is still the Palestinian issue. The Palestinians would not be ready if today for him if he is ready tomorrow. And so there has to be changes on the Palestinian side. The Palestinian Authority needs to regain legitimacy and it cannot do that without reunifying the West Bank and Gaza without going to elections. This is something that I think is doable. It's not going to be doable without uh, a, a strong motivation to do that. And I think if there is a, a, a potential for progress in the peace process, this could be that motivation. I think the US, I do not expect the administration to put any kind of leverage on either the Palestinians or the Israelis to move on the peace process. But the U.S. can do small things, like promoting, the, articulating its own position. I think Obama can and, and should articulate the U.S. views with regard to how the U.S. sees this conflict eventually resolved. Articulating position with regard to all the elements of the, of, of the conflict. Perhaps even taking a step further and going to the U.N. Security Council with that, with an outline blueprints for resolving the conflict, getting an international consensus with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese and, and everyone endorsing it, and perhaps even giving, uh, getting some Arab, uh, major Arab players to endorse uh, th that vision. I, I doubt very much that the US will do that, but this is a suggestion that I think would make a difference, again, assuming that on the Israeli side there will be receptivity if Obama believes that Netanyahu is going to say absolutely not, he will not do it. He is not, I believe, in a, 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 at this point, ready to confront Netanyahu on anything. Um, there, there is the question of succession within the Palestinian Authority. I think Abbas has become too weak and lacking illegitimacy. And I think that the Palestinian side need to consider the question of succession and to work on that. And I think there is a possibility for Abbas to play a constructive role with the, with the succession process. I think it is not going to be easy. It's going to be very, very difficult. The only Palestinian figure today that has the kind of consensus that would be required to endorse uh, a grand design for a peace agreement with Israel is Marwan Barouthi. But Marwa, he is the most popular Palestinian leader today. Uh, and he can win in any elections against any coalition against him, including uh, a very strong Hamas would still lose if Barghouti is leading the, the nationalist camp. And I, I, I think in this case, any attempt to change the domestic setup on the Palestinian side must include thinking about the role of Barghouti in, in that design. Thank you. <coughs> um, my name is Bilal Beydoun. I'm a first year master's candidate here at the Ford School. And we'll use the remainder of our time to take questions from the audience. So both of you touched upon the importance of the regional sphere of analysis um, and thinking about this conflict. So uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on the Saudi, how the Saudi-Iranian rivalry um, alters the, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict moving forward. Well, the short answer is it's complicated. Uh, it's complicated because uh, 
on one hand, as I said, uh, the perception of Iran as a threat provides a common denominator uh, between uh, Israel and some of the most important uh, Sunni Arab countries, especially the countries that are Sunni that are still countries, uh, like, like, uh, like Egypt, uh, like Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan. It's complicated, however, uh, by the fact, by the rise of ISIS. The rise of ISIS complicates things very much because uh, ISIS is also a threat to, to, to the very same Sunni Arab countries, but it's also a threat to Iran. And so, and which makes the whole issue of Syria much more complicated. And it also is, is a complicating factor as far as uh, Israel is concerned. Because now Israel has two different um, uh, enemies, threats, that are actually fighting one another. And so the, the, the maneuvering within this new environment is, is, uh, is, is very complicated. Um, and again, if, uh, if you were taking uh, what Khalil said accurately, that this new regional environment uh, is one uh, that has so far been tolerable for Israel. It's been tolerable for Israel uh, partly because um, on that realm, in this sphere, which is the regional sphere, in contrast to my assessment about where the, policy, the current policies of Israel uh, is, is leading, uh, and, and I, as, as you could gather from what I said, uh, I don't think that the present policies of my country is leading in a positive direction for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But aside from that, Israel has actually maneuvered, I would say, relatively successfully uh, in these very turbulent waters uh, of the region. It actually uh, made very few mistakes. It, Netanyahu himself has actually made very few mistakes in, uh, in both dealing with the threats uh, from the Sinai, from the Egyptian direction, um, and also the threats uh, in, in, in Syria. And these threats are very immediate. They are in very close proximity. Uh, the Syrian sphere alone in the last four years presented a menu of put thousands of options for making monumentally big mistakes. And actually, Israel resisted uh, the temptation to make mistakes. Uh, and as a result of that, it's, it's kind of largely stayed out. And now it has to, to face a, a much more complicated new reality, uh, where ISIS presents a much bigger threat, uh, side by side with Iran, with a much greater degree of at least political, potentially military and political involvement of Russia. In, in the story, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's, that's the reality. The reality is that, that uh, Iran, on one hand, provides a, a certain glue, a certain potentially uh, unifying uh, factor in Israeli-Arab relations, is, is relation, Israel's relations with Sunni Arab countries, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but for the, I would say, for the, at least in the near and, and maybe medium term, uh, as long uh, as uh, the region has not found a way to deal uh, with this new phenomenon called ISIS, uh, the, 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 the calculations of everyone is, every one of the central players is very, very complicated. And, and here again, uh, what we see, uh, with respect to, in a way, designing or reconfiguring the region to deal with these new threats, you, you see once again the absence of an architect. There is no architect. Uh, you know, there are pieces of, of policies, but that's not, uh, that's not a strategy, and the lack of strategy is because there is a lack of, of an architect. And so I think that for the, and that feeds into, again, what Khalil said, which is, uh, you know, right now the mood, therefore, is is basically risk management. It's P 
people are not thinking of solving anything. People are thinking of, of how to manage the risks. And, and as Khalil indicated correctly, the instinct of, Netan of the Israeli government right now in the face of all these challenges of everybody almost fighting everybody is to hunker down and not do anything that involves a measure of risk. And unfortunately, that's also a recipe for paralysis. I don't have much to, to add to that, I, I, except just to emphasize that I, I don't see the Saudi-Iranian conflict um, providing the kind of opportunity, a window of opportunity for Israel to be integrated into the region, finding ways to deal with a common threat and so on. Um, Israel hopes that it can do that, as I said, without having to change its policy vis-a-vis -vis the, the Palestinians. And at, at this moment, I, I, I don't see the Saudis having any kind of leverage on the uh, Israelis to do that. And it, I, I think, although the Americans um, have not been forthcoming for the Saudis, I think the Saudis still continue to believe that they can still rely on the Americans um, rather than on the Israelis, and, and that their relationship with Israel can remain uh, underground, not above ground, and that with that kind of balance, they will be able to, to manage the threat of Iran. If we're looking for, for you know, small things to disagree about, uh, I actually think that on, on one count, I think Khalil is wrong. I don't think that Netanyahu, is, uh, Netanyahu believes that these countries will come to Israel. Well, as I said, they have come to closer to Israel at a certain level. But I don't think it's the case that Khalil believes that is that Netanyahu believes. Sorry, that Netanyahu believes that 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 you could have something that resembles more an alliance without Israel paying the entry fee. Uh, he's very realistic. So the issue is, for, is not that he is under some kind of illusion that, you know, that, the, that the Saudis and the others and so on don't really care, and therefore that, that you could have this kind of an alliance without Israel paying a price in what Khalil called the Palestinian file. I don't think that that's the case. I think Netanyahu is very realistic about it. The problem with Netanyahu is different. The problem with Netanyahu is because of his reading of the Israeli domestic scene, he's not willing to pay the, the entry fee. Not that he believes that he can actually have an alliance without paying the entry fee because they'll come to him and they'll, they'll say, oh, this is so important, the threat is so great, we're willing to have an alliance without you paying the entry fee. It is not going to happen, and he knows it's not going to happen. Thank you. Next question is, um, how would you assess the BDS movement or the emergence of the BDS move movement uh, which stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, um, as a tactical response on the part of Palestinians to the current impasse? Uh, it is, there is no doubt that the, among Palestinians there is strong support for boycotting um, Israeli products, there, and, and we will see significant uh, move in that direction next year, I believe. The relations, Palestinian-Israeli relations, will be move, moving very closely to what the BDS movement is currently advocating. Um, within the circles of Palestinians who advocate a one-state solution, there is much greater support, we find, uh, for BDS than among Palestinians who advocate a two-state solution. Uh, the one-staters who are becoming a major political force uh, in terms of at least their sh sheer numbers, uh, almost one-third of the Palestinians today advocate a one-state solution, and BDS is viewed by those as the most effective means um, until recently, we now also have violence being added to the list. But the, there is a belief among the one-staters that a BDS uh, movement, uh, essentially doing what was done in the South African case, um, would be the most effective means of uh, ad addressing 
the one state reality that they believe is emerging and that is characterized by a great deal of uh, apartheid policies. The two staters, among Palestinians, the two staters do not fully buy into that. There is a strong belief that a two state solution would create two states that would interact uh, with each other, that they would live in peace, security, and cooperation with extensive economic relationship and with tremendous amount of cross border uh, relations and, and joint ventures and so on. Um, and therefore, the BDS is seen as a, as a tactical tool, uh, but is not given uh, a, a significant, uh, there isn't a belief that it would be effective in, in addressing the major concerns of the Palestinians. I, internationally, <clears throat> I doubt very much that the BDS movement will have the kind of clout that happened in the South African case until the conflict between the Palestinians and Israelis become similar to the conflict in South Africa. As long as the conflict mm -hmm. remains uh, one, uh, a struggle for independence and sovereignty for Palestinians, I think the impact will be much more limited. Thank you. Uh, our next question is um, regarding recent news or speculation that Israel may try to uh, change the status quo vis-a-vis -vis the Temple Mount. And so uh, the question is, um, you know, if you can comment on you know, Israel's is, is effort to actually do that and how this affects uh, the escalation of violence or how has it affected the escalation of violence thus far? Well, I would say just two things. Number one, in terms of the rumors, it has already affected. The mm -hmm. rumors have, have played a major role in, uh, in uh, and, and also explain why uh, we've seen much more of the violence in Jerusalem than in the West Bank. Others, other elements have to do with, so Khalil mentioned uh, the reaction of the Israeli Defense Forces. And, and that's another explanation that has to do with that, because the Israeli Defense Forces, Khalil gave them a very high grades for not making major mistakes. Uh, they're effective in the West Bank. The Israeli Defense Forces have no impact whatsoever in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is a, is, is, is part of Israel, and therefore all law enforcement in, in Jerusalem is done uh, only by the police. And uh, police is not always uh, as careful and as sophisticated uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, as the defense forces. Um, I think that uh, what we've seen in the last few weeks is that Netanyahu understands the Israeli government, and or put it this way, Netanyahu as prime minister understands uh, the, uh, the toxic potential uh, of, uh, of, of, of any rumors that Israel intends to change the status quo uh, in, in, uh, in Jerusalem and has made every effort to, uh, in the last two weeks, to. Uh, send all the, all the signals possible that Israel has no intentions in, in, uh, in changing uh, the status quo. However, he has a problem, and the problem is that, there are, that uh, he, he relies on a very, 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 very narrow coalition. He's not been willing, as Khalil explained, to take the risks that are involved in, in changing the nature of his coalition. He, he could. Uh, there are... Uh, parties that are right now in opposition that would be willing to join the government if Netanyahu is willing to commit to change direction of policy towards uh, an accommodation uh, with the Palestinians. None of these parties can afford, especially not the Zionist camp, especially not labor, they cannot afford to join the government without a change in the direction of the policy. Netanyahu is afraid that they will double cross him. Uh, but the reality is that because of that, because of his very, very narrow right-wing coalition, uh, every minister in this government believes that he can formulate policy. And the result of that is that some ministers and some deputy ministers have said all kinds of things that have given some credence to this rumor that Israel is about to change the status quo uh, in Jerusalem. And he's battling uh, this, uh, but again, is constrained by the domestic uh, composition of, his, uh, of Israeli politics at the moment. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more brief question. And so for the final question, we'll focus in on Gaza. Um, and the question is, 
given that Hamas, Hamas has acted as an antagonist at various times to both Israel and the PA, uh, can a peace agreement happen uh, so long as uh, Hamas controls Gaza? Uh, the answer is, of course, yes. You can have a peace agreement. Um, and Hamas will probably oppose it uh, and might, in fact, also use violence to try and, 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 and sabotage any effort to reach one, and if one is reached, to sabotage the implementation. Um, however, if the a peace agreement is, is accompanied by steps along the line of what I described, um, such as efforts to reconcile Farah and Hamas, such as the reunification of the West Bank and Gaza, um, and the reintegration of Hamas into the Palestinian political process, I think this would go uh, a long way in, in mitigating the consequences of such dynamics that I described earlier. I would just add to that that, that the, the whole Israeli attitude towards Hamas and Gaza is, is another indication of how, just how com more complicated the, this region has become. Because actually, I think there is a majority of opinion today uh, in the Israeli defense community that Israel should resist uh, anything that would threaten Hamas's ability to continue to control Gaza. Because the, the, the Israeli, the, there is a very strong view in the Israeli defense community that all the alternatives to Hamas in Gaza are worse. And that creates a, a, a limitation also uh, in terms of how you deal uh, with, uh, with Hamas. Um, so in a way, uh, uh, th that's, that's another component of the so-called status quo that, uh, that Khalil mentioned. I mean, I personally have an aversion to the use of the word status quo because nothing is status in the Middle East. Uh, but, but it is true that, uh, that Hamas is a component of, uh, in, in this larger equation, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, and you see this, this complicating factor because right now, who would have believed that you, you would have a situation where you'd have an Egyptian government and leadership that has uh, a more, let's say, more negative and less pragmatic views with respect to Hamas than Israel. So all I can say is welcome to the new Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we're, uh, we've run out of time, but I'd like everybody to join me in thanking Dr. Shikaki and Dr. Feldman for sharing their insights and expertise. <laughs>